So my name is Jamin Hegeman, and uh, as introduced, I am the head of design for financial services at Capital One, which is a bank in the US. Previously, I was at Adaptive Path, which is a design firm in San Francisco. Some of you might know that two years ago, Capital One acquired Adaptive Path. Adaptive Path then became an internal agency focused on service design. My role at Adaptive Path as design director was to build the practice of service design, and when we became part of Capital One, I was responsible for helping to scale service design to the organization. A few months ago, I decided to take the role of head of design for the financial services division. I now lead a team of 45 designers and researchers. And my goal in making that move was to get closer to the business units and to try to push service design further into business as usual. I am also on the management team for the Service Design Network. Service Design Network has a global conference, which is actually next week in Amsterdam. And I am the director of the Service Experience Conference in San Francisco, which takes place in two weeks. I was inspired to create this title uh, by the article called So You Want to Be an Interaction Designer by Robert Ryman, which he wrote while at Cooper, I think, in 2001. So quite an old article. But I read that when I was studying design as a master's student at Carnegie Mellon. Yeah, at Carnegie Mellon. And it set forth what it was like to be an interaction designer and what skills you needed. As someone who has been working in the field of service design for the past decade, I'm often asked, what is service design? What do service designers do? How is service design different from other forms of design? How do we bring service design into our organization? And maybe one of the most difficult questions, how do I become a service designer? Well, let's start with a question. How do you improve the patient experience at a neurosurgery clinic? Let's brainstorm this. No, brainstorming is controversial, so we're not going to bring that up. Uh, so this was the, the question uh, that I and my team was asked the first service design project that we did with the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. So like any good designers, we went and did some observation. We looked at the relationship between the surgeon and the patients in the room. We looked at the experience in the waiting room and spent whole days sitting there watching what happened. We spent time with the patients in the waiting room when they were just waiting without the nurse or the doctor, and we talked to them. And occasionally we brought tools with us to facilitate conversations about what kind of experience they would like. And we followed their journey throughout the experience all the way to the operating room to understand what is everything that they're going through in this experience. Some of the solutions that came out of this work. First, if you notice the photo of the waiting room, it looked pretty crowded. There were a lot of people in wheelchairs. A lot of those people were actually out in the hallway, which was a little bit dehumanizing to be sitting out there when you really wanted to see the doctor in the clinic. So we suggested, well, let's rearrange the chairs to make more room for wheelchairs. Surprisingly, that was controversial. Uh, which also is indicative of the challenges we face in making changes to our products and services. If changing seats in a waiting room is, whoa, 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 I'm not sure we can do that. Well, let, me, well, let me check. And here we are saying, like, no, we'll come in, we'll do it. You don't even hire anybody. We'll put them back. We also decided that the 
brochures and artifacts that were in the waiting room did not reflect the experience that you actually had with the clinic and with the surgeon. So we designed new communication artifacts to better reflect that. We also came up, at least conceptually, with a new interactive system that allowed patients to engage with staff and the, and the, the surgeon while they were in the clinic, in the waiting rooms, and even when they were at home. And why I bring this up, because I think this is a good indicator of some of the difference in the approach of service design versus the approach of product design. In product design, or if you're designing a particular touch point, someone might come to you and say, hey, I want this thing. I want you to design this tablet. I want you to design this interface. I want you to design this shoe. And you might go through your double diamond process or whatever design process you'd like to use as a model to communicate how design works, and you end up with the thing you started with, which could be fine. That's, that might be what you need. In service design, you're looking more broadly, and you don't necessarily know what kind of solutions are going to come out the end. But it's also a great opportunity because it leaves the potential solutions open. It doesn't close you to a particular way of solving the challenge, or as some people said, finding a way to connect to the meaning that people will, that will resonate with people. So let's talk about service design itself. How does a service designer think about design? Well, what is a service? I love this definition. I was surprised to find it in The Economist when I found it. But key to me here is you can't drop it on your foot, right? So product, right? Right now, I'm delivering a service. This conference is a service. It'd be very difficult to drop on your foot. I can go get a haircut. I can show you that I got a haircut, but I can't really give that to you or show that to you. A website is also kind of amorphous. And I would argue that when we talk about products and product design, often we're really talking about services. And maybe we're designing products within the context of that service. So even earlier when we saw the, was it Tune? That was a service. That was providing a service of feedback on your performance. And the way they delivered it was through the chip in the shoe, and they had to design that. But that's, they're designing a service to deliver that value for the customer. Service design, if you want a definition for that, applies the methods and craft to definition and orchestration of service experiences, which involve all the products, communications, interactions, operations, culture, structure, and organization. The good news is, if you're a designer, you're using design methods, you're using design craft, you're going through a design process which is similar to any other design process, but you're just looking at different things. And some of those aspects of service, designer like myself, I am not highly skilled in understanding operations, cultural change, or how organizations are structured, but I know that's part of the domain of service design. Another way to think about it, in the user experience, and we can argue about this if you want later, but service experience focus on all the things that someone might interact with and the relationship between those things, whether it's people, places, artifacts, while user experience tends to be more focused on the one-on-one -on -one interaction. Depends how big you draw the umbrella. Another way to think about service design and all the things that you would be considering is this model here, where yes, customer experience is part of service design, understanding the different service interactions that people are experiencing, but also understanding the staff, or the employees, or the nurses, or whomever 
your customers are interacting with, because their experience is going to have an impact on the overall service experience. And then the things that are supporting them, the products, the operations, the way a business is structured. And most businesses, as was mentioned today, are structured in an outdated system based on industrialization or tailorism, divided into silos and tried to be optimized. This doesn't always yield a great customer experience because people feel those silos. They know when they're, I mean, they might not know, but they complain when they're not connected or they're being handed off from one group to another. And the culture has a big impact on that as well. Big organizations, large organizations that have been around for a while don't necessarily have the culture that we're, I think, talking about today. That design mindset, the human-centeredness. So a lot of the work in bringing into large organizations is helping to build that culture. Younger startups, we mentioned this earlier, have an easier time of it. You're also not, again, just focused on the customer. You're building empathy with the customer, of course, but also the people delivering the service. And you need to empathize with the business. You need to understand the needs, what they're driving toward, what their metrics are. Because in service design, we talk about co-value. In designing a solution, we want to ensure that it has value for the people we're trying to serve and value for the business. Otherwise, they won't be able to sustain the promise of the service. Some ways to think about, generally, the types of service design engagements that you might experience. Could be an entirely new service. You could be starting from scratch. This doesn't happen often, but occasionally. And use the service design process to come up with a new vision or a new story of the experience you want to create. Or you might be looking at an existing service. Go through your process, and the outcomes could be anything from organizational change, process change, digital output, physical output. And again, for me, I went to design school. I'm not so skilled in some of these things. So I'm going to be working with other people to try to meet these business needs. The process. OK, there's some different tools in service design, but the process itself, again, is not too dissimilar from most design approaches. You might start with some research. That research will, of course, include talking to customers, perhaps talking to the service providers, talking to the business stakeholders, making sure you understand that, what their point of view is. Turning that research into journey maps, understanding that end-to-end -end customer journey and how that journey relates to the service we provide. Using that in brainstorming to do ideation, or maybe not. There's no, there's no right way to come up with an idea, and we use a mix of methods to do that. But those ideas become the fodder for your story, your vision. We often use storyboards or movies or other ways to communicate what is the experience. What are we driving toward? What do we hope to create? What do we aspire to? And then from that, the other key service design tool is a service blueprint which provides the customer view with the operational view, the front stage and the back stage. We saw a little bit of that earlier. And essentially provides the inventory of everything you need to create to make that service a reality or to support it. And then from that, you can determine what kind of things you need to build. You're going to be using words, like I'm throwing out right now, journey maps, ecosystem, blueprint, co-value, and journey maps are huge, gaining popularity all the time because increasingly people are, or companies are realizing that we need to understand the greater context of the experiences of our customers. There's too much stuff going on. They're interacting with all sorts of people, all sorts of services, all sorts of products, and it's not just a one-dimensional relationship with the service that you're providing. So how many people have created a journey map? Lots of people. A few years ago, if we would have Googled journey map, 
it wouldn't have yielded as many examples. Uh, this page scrolls and scrolls and scrolls. But they're becoming very commonplace. And they're useful whether you think yourself as a service designer or not. But journeys are very important to service design. And the journeys that we create are essentially a vision or the story, either the existing story or the new story that we want to aspire to. And they can happen in different dimensions. I talk about, when I talk about service design, I'm often saying levels of zoom because you're zooming in and zooming out to understand different levels of experience. So we can think about the journey in this case, if this is our bank, we've got a credit card function. We've got a banking function. We have home loans and auto loans and financial services. And we can think of the, the journey or the experience that we want to create for our banking customer. Or we can drill in and create the vision or the journey or the experience for a specific service or subservice, all supported by operations. Forward-thinking companies are looking at how they organize around experiences or journeys. Again, the journey could be the vision, what you're trying to create. So if this is our high-level story, what are all the key moments of that story that we aspire to? What are all the features that support those key moments? What touch points are we creating that represent those features? And then, what, do we, what requirements do we need to make that a reality? So as what was mentioned before, in the past, we might have started with, well, what are the requirements? But we don't have the story, and we don't have a way of organizing experience to understand our relationship in the organization, which is especially important if you're in a large organization. You want to know how your part is contributing and Im impacting either the overarching story or the people around you. So I like to think of service design as giving form to something that doesn't have a form. Designers are form makers, right? We give shape to communications, to products, to objects. We give shape to experiences. Services, again, can't, can't hold on to them, can't give them directly to somebody else. But we need a way to give it form so that we can work with it. And that's what service design does. So if you are a service designer, you start to work, look at the world a little bit differently. Like any designer, I think you start to look at the world differently. You start analyzing or critiquing things that are in the sphere of the kind of design that you do. So, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was in London, and I stayed at the Citizen M Hotel in Shoreditch. Has anyone ever stayed at the Citizen M? Yeah? I know they have a couple in the UK, one in New York, maybe a couple over here. But if you're doing any work in the future of hotel experience, you should check out this hotel, because it has a lot of things that I think would come very naturally to uh, what is the feature of hotel experience. So when you check into the Citizen M Hotel, first of all, you don't go up to a desk that has a greeter. You don't have to talk to anyone at all. You've got self-check-in. You can type in your name, select a little key card, activate it, select your room, and be on your way. There is somebody there to support you if you need it, similar to the airport, airport kiosks but you can self-check in. And then you go up to the room, and you tag the door with your card. It unlocks the door. You open the, open the door, and the lights are already on. Because who wants to walk into a dark room? Not genius, but thoughtful. Somebody thought about the experience and what that would be like, and they connected it to what you did below to what you're doing walking into that room. Then you start to notice the artifacts in the room that are helping you understand 
what the hotel provides, trying to develop a relationship or give a sense of the character of the service or brand you're interacting with. The TV has your name on it. I just selected this room. I chose it. It already knows. OK, technology. We know it can do this stuff. But hey, that's nice. It's a nice little touch. You're connecting the dots. I took this picture because I love the book Pictures of Dorian Gray. And I imagined that I could read this book. Of course, I never did because I was in London. And I went out and explored and had fun and drank beer because I like beer. And there's a tablet, and the tablet lets you control the room, everything from the TV to the lighting, the lighting of which you can change the color. So if you want the room to be green, you can do that. Controls the shades. And they even offer free porn. Who does that? <laughs> Apparently, they did some research. People were into that. I don't know. So there's all these different things. You're noticing them in a sea of lots of different experiences. And you start to put them together in a way that becomes a journey, in a way that gives shape to all these little dots. And you start to connect them. You create the story. You create a way for you to look at this experience and design it so that it's connected and makes sense for people going through it. Let's talk a little bit about the principles you follow. So what does this look like? In service design, at least according to one book, the principles are thus. Human-centered, co-creative, sequenced, visual, holistic. Now, we talked about human-centered previously, and I actually reflected on this. Why is human-centered on this list? It's design. Of course it's human-centered. It doesn't matter if it's service design or product design or communication design. It should be human-centered. But as we talked about before, we're not always acting in a human-centered fashion. We need to remind ourselves. We need to remind our businesses. And I think that's why it's on this list. So that means doing research, engaging with people. This is some work we did in the past with the McKesson Foundation, helping to figure out how to deliver a service that provides care packages to cancer patients uh, when they have to suddenly uh, go to the hospital uh, without any planning. Going back to the neurosurgery clinic, we're doing research here and getting the human-centered perspective of the nurses. What is their world like? And we're using visualization tools to help them have that conversation. Both of those previous examples are also maybe examples of co-creation. But we're being co-creative not just with the customers, but with the service providers and the people who run the business themselves. So here, we've got concepts and that we generated looking at the journey map. And we've got the process engineer and the vice president of the service arranging them in order to help create the new story, to help start creating the new service. And of course, we're co-creative with customers giving them tools and the ability to express what they need. Sequencing, so here's the maybe some journey map fodder. This is uh, just a template that we created that answers some of the key questions of the journey map we did during a workshop using sticky notes, very orderly. And this captures what are people doing what are people thinking? What are they feeling over time? And we're organizing it into stages so that we have some way of structuring that experience and understanding how it works end to end. We can turn those into journey maps. And journey maps can take various forms and representations. A lot of the journey maps I see have you know, an emotional graph. And I'm using this one in particular because it does not. This is a journey map uh, we created 
working with uh, some service providers in San Francisco who provide services to teenagers with mental health issues. And in working with them, understood that that emotional journey graph wasn't going to give them the utility they needed and understanding they needed to make decisions to improve their service experiences. So we created this. Sequencing also applies to blueprints. So I mentioned service blueprinting before. We saw some examples earlier. Blueprints have a front stage and a back stage. The things the customer sees, so very customer-centric, customers at the top. The touch points that they're interacting with, followed by the staff that they might be interacted with. The line of visibility, so everything below that's magic. And that could be people, processes, technology that's supporting that. But it's a way to see end-to-end -end how are you providing the service? Where do you fit into this? And then we're making things visual. We do that in different ways from some of the maps we showed before, but it's also could be creating models. This is a business origami kit. Uh, this kit in particular was created by Jess McCullen, but it was inspired by some designers at Hitachi. And I've since created my own little kit to be able to model physical experiences and show relationships to design services. But as we keep talking about today, it's also about creating and visualizing the story, visualizing the experience, helping people understand beyond the requirements, what is it we're trying to accomplish. It's about being holistic, so understanding ecosystems. This is the ecosystem map that we created when we were working for a company looking at what future energy services might look like. So we wanted to know what were all the possible things that we might consider in that space and what relationship did they have to somebody who consumes energy. But they're also holistic in how we think about delivering them. Here, creating the roadmap for the vision of a new service experience. You can see across the top the story that we're trying to create, and then all the different projects that will need to be created and executed to make that story a reality. So if you're thinking about creating service design or building it into your team, where do you start? What might you do? This is my take on some of the process that companies and organizations and even some design firms go on. One, you hire designers. You can hire external designers. I think this is where most people start. There are service design agencies in the world. Not a lot, but there are some. There's even one here in Lisbon, at least one that I know of. But you can hire them in to start influencing your team, influencing your culture, getting them to work with you in a co-creative, collaborative way, participate in that experience, so you start to learn the language, the tools, the processes. But after a while, you realize that, hey, it can't just be this separate service design team or service designers. We need to have cross-disciplinary collaborative teams that combine business mindset, design mindset, technology, marketing, operations. And we start building different types of teams. And then, maybe way over here, and very, very few, but some, companies are starting to think about this, maybe we change the way that we're organized. Maybe we organize around experiences and we have different functions and different roles. In terms of how you engage with service designers, again, you might have, if the, if the dark blue dots are your business or the non-designers, you might, yes, at first interact externally. Or, as we've tried doing it in Capital One in some cases, having individual designers join product management teams and influence in a one-to-one -one relationship. Of course, as in this thing, they're outnumbered. Or maybe you do a hybrid. And this is where I think my team will ultimately go. We have some designers who are able to work on strategic projects and augment teams while others are embedded to support teams in ongoing operations. 
So a service design team, if we create new teams, might be built on all these different disciplines rather than just a designer. And we talked a little bit about discovery and delivery earlier, but in service design, since part of it is setting that vision, maintaining that story, and planning for that, we need to find ways to interact between the day-to-day -day operations and delivery and maybe a separate track that is always pushing the aspiration, pushing the story, responding to what we're learning as we deliver and change operations, but are also influencing delivery and operations. And radically, what if there was a service experience officer? One thing that I have realized in my consulting work is no one owns the end-to-end -end customer experience. When I try to find the person who's in charge, I usually have to get to the president. And that's not actually the person who's going to be making sure that everything is seamless and ties together and connects the dots. So what if we had both teams that are dedicated to that in the individual businesses and somebody who's responsible for that and accountable for delivering on the story and finding the meaning to connect to people. All right, so let's say some of you are curious, service design curious, and you ask me the difficult question of, well, where do I start? Uh, some easy answers. Well, you can read the service design books. And there's a great website out there called servicedesignbooks.org. Uh, pretty straightforward, so congratulations on them for doing that. Uh, a couple of my favorites, though, are listed on the side. This is service design thinking. Uh, I'm a little bit biased because I have a case study in there, but it's a good reference book. There's some other very thoughtful books on there. Learn the tools. Start bringing the tools into your practice. This is another very complicated website called servicedesigntools.org. And it's a great compendium of different methods, techniques, and many case studies to go along with it. It can help you figure out which things to build into your practice. Well, you can go to conferences. Obviously, I'm at the wrong conference because this is a product conference and I'm a service person. Sorry about that. But there are conferences out in the world. Increasingly, uh, the SDN conference, Service Design Network conference, is in its eighth year. And since we launched that, so many more service design conferences have emerged. You can start to rethink your life and go, well, this seems very interesting. Maybe I'll go back to school. That's what I did. Of course, I didn't actually know about service design when I went back to school, so I cheated in a way. But you could take some time out of your life and really get in deep with these methods, really gain some experience so that you can go out and start marketing yourself. Increasingly, though, there are people looking for service designers. I'm hiring service designers. I need them in my team. So it's starting to become a thing. But still, not too many people, and if you don't have the skills and experience, it could be difficult. So you could start doing service design in your own work, or at least bring in some of the methods and tools. Bring in journey mapping. That's not a controversial tool. <laughs> Maybe do a blueprint. We call blueprints the gateway drug to service design. Because when you do them with operations folks, they suddenly get it. They suddenly see the connection between their world and the customer experience. And they're constantly hearing the customer experience is important, but they don't know how to connect to it. So try blueprints for that. Of course, if you're all by yourself in an organization doing that, you might not be learning as much. Uh, but then there's the community. Go to workshops, go to conferences, Tap into people in your local neighborhood. But ultimately, you need to build your skills. And this slide is 
again, connected to, so you want to be an interaction designer, where Robert Ryman essentially outlines what is the focus of interaction design, what is the approach, and therefore, what abilities or skills do you need? So I tried to summarize my view on that. If the focus is orchestration of service interactions across time and designing both the front and the backstage and about finding value, co-value for both the customer, the staff, and the business, and you're an advocate for the customer, employee, and business, and you're looking at that broader ecosystem in relation to these different moments and you're co-creating, then you need to be able to work both in problem framing and design execution, empathizing, working across disciplines, connecting dots, visualizing stories, communicating, and understanding various design approaches, if not being very deeply skilled in one of them, in various forms of design. And then you might ultimately start to develop a different craft. Due to the nature of service design, there's lots of collaboration, there's lots of leading collaboration, leading workshops, engaging different groups and people. So you become a facilitator. You're working on defining a, a, a vision across these different experiences. So you are a storyteller. You're orchestrating and making sure that these things are connected and executed together. That the, that the course is singing together. So you're a conductor. And then, of course, you're delivering results for the business, for the end customer. You're a designer. So there's three things I'd like you to take away from this. One, our products don't live on their own, and hopefully this is not a huge relevation to you. Just a reminder that increasingly we need to understand the ecosystem, the journeys, the broader experiences, and how people are navigating through them, and service design tools can help us do that. So whether you're a service designer or not, service design is relevant to you, and might one day just be part of what you do. But until then, if you want to be a service designer, there's a heck of a lot of complexity out there. There's a lot of problems. The world needs you. Thank you.